All right, man. Well, we are live. This is uh, my first uh, podcast here, and this is Music on the Rocks with Chris Castellanos. This is going to be fun. I'm really looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to this. And my first guest, guest number one. Do it, man. Yeah, man. Guest number one. Is Music the on the Rocks. I love it. Music on the Rocks. Cheers, man. Great Jerry Peel. Cheers, man. Mm. So, what is your beverage of choice? Well, I'm, actually, um, I'm actually drinking a Tito's Martini. And uh, I started drinking Tito's. Uh, this is probably not uh, something that's good <laughs> concerning this <laughs> subject matter. But I started drinking it years ago before anybody knew about Tito's. I'm mm. in South Miami to turn me on to it and taught me how to make a martini. And here I am many years later still doing it awesome man well i'm having a uh a gin and tonic here Excellent. i got this uh madame petrini it's a small batch gin from utah local here local Woo. yeah well cool um so i just you know i mean we're gonna open this up uh this is just gonna be this is just for fun and uh and mostly just because i want to talk to you <laughs> i haven't talked to you in a little while you know since i last know. Time I was at Rutgers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I follow you everywhere best I can, you know, in the ways that I have available to me. But uh, it's never the same as when we when we're able to hang together. So I'm glad this has happened. Thank you. Oh no, thank you, man. So a couple things about Jerry. Uh, this is not for you because you know about you, of course. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll if, talking then. All right. If you don't think you've heard Jerry Peel or you don't know the name Jerry Peel, you've heard him and you know him. You just don't know that you know him. Uh, I mean, you've heard him on uh, everything from Sinatra to Streisand. He's played with Casey and, and the Sunshine Band, recorded with them, recorded with Chuck Mangione, uh, recorded with the Tonight Show Band, uh, Jocko Pistorius, John Faddis, Dizzy Gillespie. I mean, the list goes on, man. Even Inigo Montoya. Or Mandy Patinkin. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, those, yeah. Those, those were great days, man. Sometimes I sometimes I can't remember all those recordings, but it's nice to see them listed because I go, hmm, I think I do remember that. So those are good times. Yeah. Well, it's an incredible discography, man. I mean, it's just you know, and not not a lot of horn players have done that kind of stuff. I mean, it's it's just it's not classical recording. A lot of it. I mean, most of your discography, I mean, is is to do with with popular music and to do with jazz and uh, just idioms that the horn aren't really known for all that often. Well, you know, man, back in uh, about a hundred years ago, uh, probably in the late 60s, early 70s, I really believed that the horn could and should be featured more as a, as a commercial instrument. And so I kind of dived into uh, some projects that uh, some of them came off, some of them didn't. Um, and, uh, th but the idea behind all those things was to feature the horn in a way that it hadn't really been featured before. So, you know, I, I asked some people who I knew and respected and loved to write some music for me for horn and wind ensemble at the time, because I was not able to find a lot of, um, a lot of music that, that fit that genre. And, and I knew horn players uh, to a large degree had wanted something to, to, to solo on with wind ensemble. A lot of things are available for orchestra, but not for that uh, particular uh, ensemble. So I was able to, to amass about five um, solos with wind ensemble. And only two of them have I recorded and not any of them uh, professionally. But still, they're there and a lot of other people have played them. And so I feel good about having uh, created some of those things for everybody out there to play. And most mm -hmm. of them, some of them are, are you know, better than others. But for the most part, they're they're really solid, solid pieces. You know, then I I, I also really wanted to, to do a solo project, keeping those things in mind. And again, ask all my friends to write things for me because I had no money. 
and uh, ended up putting out a, a, a disc at that point called um, Horn of a Different Color. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some, a couple of studio things on there. Uh, most of them were done in a little eight track studio in North Miami. And uh, really an amazing pro project. And it's amazing that the things that came out of that little eight track studio, analog, uh, everything had to be bounced down. The click track was a, uh, was a uh, mechanical metronome in a closet with a microphone. So wow, man. as primitive as one can possibly be. Um, and we pulled it off. So um, I'm really, not that, the, not that the sound of the recording is, is really great. Uh, there are a couple of tunes that I did in New York, but um, but uh, most of it was done in that little studio, and I'm I'm proud of the product, you know. So, and then yeah. uh, it, it, you know, it, and I it had just been released when I when I moved to New York uh, from okay. Miami. I'd been in Miami for many years, and um, the, the orchestra went out of business. Uh, in the I was teaching at the University of Miami at the time. And and the, uh, the 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 money wasn't very good at that point coming out of the university. So, you know, I had a, a wife and two kids, and uh, not enough money to sustain us there, because the orchestra had died. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. And so we <laughs> decided to uh, move to the New York area. Now, how long were you at Miami? Oh Lord, I was there for a good twenty years. Yeah, mm. I went there as a student. And then stayed and, and taught uh, in the public schools actually there when I first graduated from school, from college, and then went back and got my master's and um, but all the time I was playing principal horn in the orchestra there, and uh, actually played first horn in that orchestra for about eighteen years, so I've got a lot of orchestral background uh, you know uh, experience, and uh, so I think that's held me in good stead because when I went to New York. Um, I was hired to do a, a lot of excerpts with the New York Philharmonic, but they didn't really know what to do with me. Um, <laughs> I, and I, you know, I I played a lot with the Philharmonic until I started working a lot more in the studios, and uh, had no time for rehearsals, so I had to turn them down. And after two or three times turning the New York Philharmonic down, they don't call you anymore. <laughs> uh, right. So, uh, you know, that's the way that kind of. Went. Well, I was going to ask you about your orchestral experience because I know you mostly for your recordings yeah. and uh, and your your uh, kind of commercial uh, playing. But I I was curious if you had done any ten year time in orchestras and it sounds like you did quite a few yeah. years. The orchestra in Miami was really quite a good orchestra, and um, you know had a, a full season and and we played a. Uh, had a conductor who was uh, during the heyday of the orchestra, um, uh, Alain Lombard, who was a French conductor, and he was a maniac. I mean, literally a maniac, and loved the horn. And so he programmed all the Mahler symphonies, all the Bruckner symphonies, all the Strauss tone poems. He he broadcast did everything that I ever wanted to play. I don't think there was anything that went by that. I said, you know, I'm sorry we missed that one because I didn't. So it was great for me. And, oh, that's uh, amazing, man. That's awesome. But as I said, he was a he was completely maniacal. He was a crazy, crazy guy. <laughs> He's the kind of guy that started a downbeat from the wings. You know, <laughs> so you damn well better be ready because when he hits the when he hit the podium, the band had to start. You know, so it was kind of a cool way of going. Except for Oberon. Oh. That night, he walked on and very slowly and got on the podium and waited and waited and waited and, you know, the way you feel sitting there. Right. And a third horn player that was not in the employ of the orchestra for too long after leaned over and said, you know what I hate about this solo? <laughs> and he says, uh, you never know what's going to come out. And so oh, no. uh, that, that was one of those moments that you never forget. And uh, fortunately, it, it went okay. But but the conductor completely changed his colors that night. He took his, his merry time, which was not to my advantage. But 
anyway. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's <laughs> one of the solos where it's like, you know, I mean, you're just, everybody's kind of waiting and they're waiting for the beautiful horn. The, that's right. Not, not the prime time for the third horn player to lean over and say something. <laughs> so, as I said, that, that person didn't last too long. It was not something <laughs> good. <laughs> oh, man. So, well, where did your beginnings from the, of the horn begin? I mean, are you from a musical family? No, actually. Well, not really. Uh, and I'll give you a quick synopsis. Uh, I could go on quite a while for this, but I know you don't want to hear it all. But I want to hear it all, baby. I'm from East Texas. Oh, and, so big band uh, state. So big band state. And, you know, I started uh, tonet or song flute or whatever the hell they called it then in the fourth grade, I guess, fifth grade. And then uh, the, next, the next thing was to choose instruments. And all, most of my close guy friends wanted to play trumpet. <laughs> of course. So, yeah, let's do it, you know? So I chose the trumpet as well. And there were four of us that uh, were best friends and we chose the trumpet. And um, I was, and I had a challenge every week for chairs, for seating. Uh -huh. And uh, I always came out fourth chair, always. <laughs> we have something never, in common, man. <laughs> I was never able to, to beat those other three guys. So at the end of my eighth grade year, the band director said to me, uh, you know, would you like to switch to French horn? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I, don't, I don't really want to do that. I want to stay where I am. He said, okay, fine. He was a horn player. Um, then uh, later on, as the, this, the year went on, uh, the horn section in the band was so horrible, so bad. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that they could possibly be as bad as they were. And so I finally went to him and I said, yeah, I'd like to switch. And uh, so I did. And uh, so it must have been the end of my eighth grade year, beginning of my ninth grade year. And uh, made all state band my freshman year in, in high school. So, you know, that was wow. a real, real strong beginning for me. And um, so I was, it sounds like it was the right instrument. It was. The trumpet was not, even though I played trumpet during marching season, which was not a smart thing to do. <laughs> and and yes. we realized during my senior year that, you know, if I'm going to be a horn player, I damn well better not be playing trumpet a whole lot. So right. I played I played bass drum my senior year in high school. <laughs> the so, you have it. You know, you know what the band scene is like in, in Texas. Of course. And, yeah. I was in a little town that uh, had about 1,500 people, one light, a malt shop at one end of town, and another kind of a malt shop at the other end of town, uh -huh. uh, out by the auction barn. And so <laughs> it was the uh, weekly uh, hang, hang to go back and forth between those things. Uh, well, that's really but, cool. I've always been really uh, like attracted to band music. I mean, when, when I was growing up, I loved listening to orchestral music but I loved playing in bands more, you know, in wind bands yeah, and, yeah. and stuff uh -huh. like that. It, it, it just seemed like there was more to play all the time, you know, and when you, whenever you played transcriptions, it was like that you're just always going and it's, it's really good for the face and it was a lot of fun, you know? I mean, I, I really just always enjoyed playing with wind bands. Well, when I graduated from high school, I went to uh, Sam Houston State, mm -hmm. where, Huntsville, Texas, which is where the uh, prison system is so uh when they burn somebody the lights all dimmed in the town oh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> that didn't really happen but that was always the <laughs> that was going to happen but anyway so i went to school there studied with tom newell who was principal horn in, in houston uh -huh. and the houston guys all came to huntsville it's about an hour drive north of houston and taught once a week so i i I studied with Tom for the first semester. Uh, he auditioned for the Boston Symphony and won the job, won the third horn job, mm. and mm -hmm. left. And so the guy that came in and took, uh, took his position was uh, uh, Jim Tankersley, which I'm sure you've never heard the name Tankersley. But um, he stayed there for many years. The beginning of my sophomore year, studying with him, he asked me, this, this has to do with orchestral playing. So um, I'll tie this back to that real quickly. 
Uh -huh. uh, he came to me one day and he says, look, the, the, the orchestra is going on tour uh, beginning of the second semester. And I'd like for you, the, the assistant first horn is not go, able to go. So I'd like for you to go, if you could, and, and play assistant to me. And I said, man, that would be great. You know, here I am, a kid from East Texas, still had cow dung on my shoes, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the remarkable thing about the story is there was no college orchestra. The only thing huh. they had, Houston was a few string players. And every now and then they would have uh, a concert and bring a couple of brass players or wind players in to cover a couple of parts. And that was the extent of my orchestral experience. So for me to be asked to play with the Houston Symphony as assistant first horn was pretty remarkable for me. I, you know, it was like, I was No, scared. that's remarkable for anybody. That's amazing. So the story goes like this. I go to the first rehearsal with the orchestra and the, uh, Sir John Barbaroli was the conductor. The first thing, I've never been in an orchestra in my life. I splattered that D sharp so bad. As a matter of fact, I went back for a concert in Jones Hall a couple of years ago, and I'd swear I heard that D sharp still reverberating around the hall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, Barbara Rowley stopped the orchestra, and I didn't know the meaning of the word glower until that moment, but I learned it very fast. Oh, man. Tankersley, without moving at all, said out of the side of his mouth, will you cool it? You're going to get us all fired. Oh, no. And that changed my attitude about playing the horn up to that point dramatically. I had no confidence. I was scared to death after that. That one thing really, really did a number on, on me believing whether or not I could be a horn player or not. It was quite the moment, you know, in terms of, of what I uh, had to go through and, and, and what I learned about myself. And, uh, you know, it was a great tour. We went up the Eastern Seaboard, and, you know, Miami up to New York and, and played all the big halls at that point. This was back in 1963, 64, somewhere in there. I don't mean to cut you off, but I mean... No, please do. What, I, what, I what you... <laughs> Well, what you just uh, mentioned, I mean, just that, that moment, making a mistake and, and becoming fragile all of a sudden. Yep. And yes. horn players, that's something we have to deal with an awful lot. I mean, it doesn't matter how long you've been playing even. I mean, it's it, something can happen to like set you back in your ego and just set you back, period. And it's like, it's hard to, to overcome that again. Uh, and it, it happens over and over and over again. It happens when you're young, happens when you've been playing for 30 years, and it's just the confidence level of when you have to play the horn is just walking that tightrope all the time. And you realize that when you're in performance, you don't have any sort of harness attaching you to the tightrope. You're just kind of naked. And, and if you let that get into your head, it can really do a job on you. you know? Yeah, there's no net. There's just, there's no net. So... You know, you either make it or you don't. Right. In many instances. And I can tell you stories, which I won't because they're all embarrassing, but I could tell you stories where things like that, I mean, there's a lot of successes, but there were things that, and I remember every one of them. You know, right. I don't remember the great successes, but I do remember those moments that I was mm. made, what the hell am I doing with this thing in my hand? <laughs> well, speaking of, speaking of great successes, man, when did you start playing with uh, Les Mis? Uh, well, I came to New York in the early 80s. Uh -huh. And as I already said, I, they, they, people didn't know what to do with me. Uh, and so I was trying to get as many jobs as I could, as quickly as I could. Um, the thing about most of the guys who were in the recording part of New York. It was a real segmented town at that point. Mm -hmm. And there were recording guys, and then there were the guys that did orchestral stuff and guys that did Broadway. Okay. And the guy that did the studio stuff didn't really want to do Broadway. I won't say that they considered those people to be second-class players, but there was a lot of that. 
Oh, okay. it, but it was. And the Broadway players resented that, and they should have. You know, they had a right to. But because I needed work, and people started knowing that I was in town, they would call me for Broadway subs. And I was always happy to have the job. I was always happy to be able to go in and, you know, and I always did a good job because reading was not one of my problems, fortunately, because at that point, now it's different. But back in those days, you went in, you watched the book one day or one performance and the next performance you were on. Right, right. There was no, you know, anybody going through it and helping you out. You were on. So what was your first show? My first show, um, well, I subbed on Cats. I worked on, I subbed on 42nd Street. I subbed on a whole bunch of them. I I don't remember all of them right now. But Uh the very first show I had was called, is a little uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber show called Song and Ants, which nobody remembers. Mm -hmm. Uh, It only lasted probably less than a year. And Brooks Tillotson, another great name, in the New York horn scene over a hundred years, uh, played it with me. And, um, and it didn't last, but as soon as it closed, the contractor for that show was contracting Les Mis. So this is like at the genesis of Les Mis, like it had, nobody knew it. I mean, it came to New York and I played the first rehearsal in New York. Wow, man, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it had been running in London but uh, it was a big splash when it came to New York. And uh, Brooks and I played it, and there were three trumpets and, and one trombone, and uh, wood, some flute, clarinet, and uh, oboe, and strings, and percussion, and keyboard, you know, the regular thing. But, but the brass section was two horns, three, and one trombone, bass trombone. Um, so we, we were asked to do it, and of course, it was, everybody knew it was gonna be a huge hit. Right. So, Nobody said no, um, and I'm so happy that I did it. Obviously, I mean, of course, we did the we did the soundtrack and we did you know everything, and it was a yeah. I was going to say you're on the Broadway uh, release, release, yeah, not the London release, but the Broadway release, and um, it was you know people people aren't you thrilled every night to go in and play that show? My wife saw it several times, cried every time. And, uh, you know, so people love the show. I mean, people absolutely yeah. love the show. And, and I took a night off and, and went to see it. And, you know, it is, it was, it was a great production. Um, How many but, shows did you play of it? Do you remember? Well, that's part of the story. Uh, you get tired of it pretty fast. Uh-huh. This is a terrible thing to say, but uh, there's a lot of uh, situations that you make you feel like you're kind of part of a, Punching out a headlight in an auto plant every night, you know. You go and play the same notes, exactly the same. You can't, delete, you can't change. It's got to be the same, exactly yep. every night, you know. And it gets old. No, no question about it. And I, yeah. re- I really respect those people. I have so much respect for them. Uh, yeah. I had trouble with that. So I played three years, and then I kind of st- started subbing a lot more than I should have. And uh, I finally I left the show. But there were people that finished that show after 16 years. I mean, it's one of those things as a musician. I mean, I talk to my wife about this uh, a lot, that we know so many great, great, great musicians who don't have steady work. Yeah. You know, and it's once you've got a show like that, I mean, it's, it's hard to let go. Even if you feel like maybe it's time to move on or something it's like really should I move on from this well fortunately for me Chris there was a lot of recording work so I was still working really I was working a lot mostly jingles at that point uh, a lot of films uh, during that time period and so it wasn't like I you know I just felt a sigh of relief a little bit when I when I had that time to stay home with the kids at night and stuff like that, you know? Right. I mean, when your kids are young and you're leaving at five o'clock or six o'clock in the afternoon and then you don't get back till midnight or after, I mean, that's a problem. Yeah, I, you know, I played uh, Phantom of the Opera on the Las Vegas Strip for six years. Yeah. And, wow. and uh, the musicians were great and the, and the music was great. Uh, 
and the paycheck was great, <laughs> yeah. but it was hard for me also. Uh, yeah. One of those things where it's, it's show number 1000. Now it's show number 1500. And it's just like, and, and you know, the book backwards and forwards and you don't even have the music on the stand anymore. It's a fun show to play. But if I had to go back, you know, three weeks in a row or six weeks in a row, I wouldn't have done it. You know? Right. So. When, when you were playing it, did you ever play any like, uh, like head games with yourself? I used to do stuff like, uh, like I would pretend like it was a recording session or I would just anything to keep my focus going, you know, cause it's so easy to lose. Your, like I remember one point, uh, I had to, I turned over to the second horn player and I, and I asked him, this is a genuine question. Did I play the last horn solo? Like I, I didn't know if right. I, you know what I mean? And it's like, so I would have to start playing games with myself. Like, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm recording this or I'm going to hone in and zoom in on like, the clarinet part today or see if I can listen to violin too <laughs> or whatever it is, you know? So that's the kind of thing you have to do. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's one, one, one story. I read a lot. So I always had a book on a stand, you know, and, um, and sometimes you get into it. I mean, you get into your book, you get into your story, you know, and you have to listen and know what's going on around you musically and play when it's time to play. So I remember well one night I was reading and I was really into what I was reading. And I heard something that sounded vaguely familiar over here on the side of my head. And um, turns out the principal trumpet sitting right behind me played my part on, the, on his flugelhorn. No way. <laughs> he, knew, he saw that I wasn't going to play. Wow. <laughs> out of it so he played it for me so i turned around to thank me and he had a little shitty grin on his face you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i bet you owed him a drink uh, after uh, that show. But, yeah so you know those things go on all the time though yeah mm -hmm. but and, and i don't mean to denigrate the the art form at all of course don't misunderstand it just for me at that time there was so much going on in my life that i i i needed to i needed to stay Let's use the word current. I don't know if that's the word or not, but I need, you get show chops also. Right. Where you play the same show all the time. You go out and try to play something else. It's different. I know it doesn't sound like that would be the case, but it is. Don't play as well outside of that. So you have to practice a lot more. And most people like Brooks Tillerson, for instance, left his horn in the locker every night. Problem with that was if he got a call to do, if we were dark on Sunday and he got a, a record date or a jingle on Monday morning, he didn't have a horn. <laughs> so oh, that's hilarious. He, he had to borrow an instrument from somebody in order to go play his day. You know, so it's that kind of stuff going on. So, uh, but yeah. he was a great friend and, and a wonderful colleague. So, and, and, that's awesome, man. A lot of Brooks Tillerson stories out there. Yeah. Well, you had mentioned that you had played on, on soundtracks. Do you have any favorites? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, I probably played on, I don't know, close to 100 films, mm -hmm. you know, New York, which, which is a lot, but in L.A. parlance, it ain't nothing, you know. <laughs> so that's a week's worth of work, you know. Yeah, the L.A. players so like that. that. But... Uh, uh, Disney recorded there a lot. We did Beauty and the Beast, oh, and no we did uh, Cape Fear, mm. and um, uh, there were there were so many. Um, I get a, a printout every year with, with a check for two dollars and fifty cents. You know, <laughs> some of those films are still playing. Um, and I look at that list, and I go, "Wow, I don't remember playing that film." Uh, you yeah. know, I really don't remember that. And it maybe it's because my memory is fading, but but there are just a lot of things, you know, that, that you Well, it's do. also that the, the sessions weren't that long. I mean, it's just, and the movie wasn't, it's not like you knew how big or small the movie was going to be at the time. You're just going sometimes in for... You, you know, sometimes you did, sometimes you, most of the time you did. But I think to answer your first question, my favorite film of all time to have, to have done and played Principal Horn on uh, was The Untouchables. Oh, nice. I didn't yeah. know that. It just was a, you know, it was a fun date. 
uh, dates. Uh, and there were six horns on the on the on the film, um, and the, uh, the the composer Ennio Morricone was was the composer of that of that score. Yeah, he's, he's so great. Oh, it, you know his music is there's never anything wrong. You know, it's just great. But Excellent. he speaks very little English, mm -hmm. uh, and so they hired a beautiful young lady from the from the Italian embassy to come and be his interpreter. So everybody paid really close attention. <laughs> it was, <laughs> everybody knew exactly what he was saying. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. So it was it was fun, you know, and um, there's 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 one story that's kind of interesting out of that film. Uh, there was a there was a cue that they were going to use. I think it was in a bedroom scene. I don't remember, but it was they already it, it was strings and and solo. So the principal flute on the on the film was Trudy Kane, who was mm -hmm. the principal flute with the, with the Met. And uh, so she and I were pretty good friends and, and remain so. And now she's just retired from the University of Miami. Ironically, uh, I helped her get that job, you know, several years ago. But, but anyway, they chose her to play this thing first. So it was going to be, they were going to have the flute do it and then they were going to have the horn do it. And so she played, everybody left the, the studio except for the strings and Trudy and I. And I tell you, Chris, it was like angels had descended on the studio. You know, wow. it was like, good Lord, you know, it was just gorgeous. And so it finished and they said, okay, now we'd like to the horn. I said, wait a minute, you really <laughs> mean to play this after that? You really think you're going to use the horn after hearing that? Well, we just want to have choices. So we recorded it. But of course, they used the flute. You know, I mean, <laughs> but I knew, I knew yeah. no matter who played it, it wasn't going to be used in, a, in the film. But anyway, it was, a, it was a great, great project and a lot of fun. And I uh, really enjoyed that one. Yeah. Uh, well, that's so cool, man. I mean, you know, I have uh, a lot of friends who play in studios and, and I mean, us horn players, of course, we always geek out over the movie stuff because... I mean, let's face it, that's that's a big reason why a lot of us start playing. I mean, the right. first time you hear the horn is in the movies. And, and then somebody tells you that, yeah, that's a French horn playing that. And then you realize the horns play a lot in the movies and, and you become a fan of it. And, and it becomes one of those things that you really, you hope that you can do someday. I mean, I'm sure that every horn player at one point has wanted to play in the movies, you know? So it's really cool that, that, I mean, the, just the movies that you rattled off. I didn't realize that you had played those. I, I mean, and that's another crazy thing about the movies is that they never have the orchestra listed, really. And, no. and so it's like, you don't know who's playing. And it's like, right. but of course, they've got like the, the person who gave the meals to people. at the, <laughs> And it's like the person who held the microphone or whatever. Yeah, they know who he is. No question about that. No. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and a lot of people are curious. I mean, I'd say a lot more people are probably curious about who plays the flute in a movie than who is uh, providing lunch during the set, but who knows. But anyway, I, I think that that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they say, and they're right. I had heard this before I started doing those, those dates that playing film dates is like 98% boredom and 2% sheer terror. And it's true. You know, you sit there and sit there and sit there and you play whole notes and you and all of a sudden the lick comes up, you know? Right. And uh, so, but the lick is there and you play it and you, you play it well and you feel real good about it, about the, the, the product, you know? So, and that's so why you get I hired to come back and do another one. Exactly, man. Well, I'm really curious. What are some of your favorite uh, commercial recordings that you've done? Uh, be more specific about what you mean by commercial recordings. Well, I mean, just like an yeah. album of a, a great singer or an album of like a great uh, instrumentalist. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I've got a favorite that you've done, of course, and you know what it's going to be, but I want to get to what is your favorite before that. Yeah. Well, that's probably ranks way up high with, in my list, but that, that has another connotation to it altogether. But, um, uh, you know, it, just like the films that I was talking about, a, a lot of things I don't remember doing. Yeah, it's a film date. You go in with two trumpets and three horns, and, and you do this eight-bar phrase, and then it's repeated, and you never play again, leave, and you forget you did it. So that's that happened a lot in New York. Um, but that being said, um, John Faddis did a, a record called, oh, he, he stole my record name. That's what it was, because I wanted to do a CD called Hornacopia, uh -huh. which I thought, it's a natural man. Of course. <laughs> and Faddis called us to come in and do a, a tune on his new CD called Hornacopia. So anyway, <laughs> ticked me off just a little bit, but uh, I was slow on the uptake, obviously, and he had more money than I did, and we were able to, <laughs> he was able to do this, and I wasn't able. But anyway, we did uh, a piece called, I think the tune was called High Five, as I remember. I could be wrong about that, but I believe Four Horns and John, uh, and mm -hmm. full, you know, full rhythm section. Anyway. But the, the bridge of that piece is, has screaming horns in it. And right. it was so much fun. He had always wanted to write for horns. I used to, I, I've done hundreds of dates with John over the years in New York. And he always talked about, man, I want to write for you guys. I want to write for horns. And he did on this. Mm -hmm. on this. And it was great. And it was so much fun uh, that that stands out in my mind as one of the things that, you know, I will always remember. Another one, which uh, happened before I left Miami, is um, I was, you know, the Bee Gees were there, or still there, the, the remaining Bee Gee. But uh -huh. uh, they were. They, were, they had a recording studio there and did all their, their work there. And uh, I got called to come in and do um, a couple of tunes for Barry and Barbara Streisand. Yeah. That, that was the Guilty album. And it was just me in the studio with Barry uh, and his engineer, Albie Galutin, also a famous engineer, worked for them. So you tracked the horn part just and, by itself? Had, or, you know, had already, they had already done their, their vocals. Right. So I was providing the horn parts, and there were three parts to each one of these tunes. And you recorded all three? So I recorded all three of them. But, okay. you know, just the fact of, of being in the studio with Barry to begin with, yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. having, uh, you know, Barbara Streisand sing to me while I was playing oh. was, was pretty cool, you know. And uh, so that was a, a, a meaningful night as it were, and, uh, and there are some other stories about that recording session I can't really tell. But anyway, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And, oh, uh, come on, you can tell. Yeah, that means you're not drinking enough martini, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was, there were some, there, there were some things on the, uh, on the control panel when we, when I finished the session that um, kept me there for a while, but. So anyway, um, you can cut yeah, some of it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah, we can uh, always edit, man. <laughs> okay, so anyways, you know, there, there are a lot of those things. Uh, yeah. And, in, 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 you know, when you think about them, it's not generally a huge uh, thing, but it's usually little things that happen during the session or little little reasons why it meant a lot to you. And it's right. all, it, many times it has nothing to do with the fact that it was a you know famous singer or a, mm -hmm. you know famous instrumentalist. Well, so. you say that you forget about a lot of the recordings that you've done or movies, but I mean, every once in a while, you got to be walking through a mall or something like that and go, yeah. "Hey, wait a minute, that's me." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true. It does happen, and you look around and you realize nobody else really gives a crap. You know, <laughs> it's pretty funny. It's kind of well. Us horn players care, man. I care. It kind of brings you right down to, to uh, the, the most base place that you could possibly be as a player. Yeah. 
who cares, man? I want to know how you got the uh, opportunity to record with uh, Chuck Mangione. And then did you realize that the uh, lullaby, basically, right? I mean, what was it called? Uh, the uh, lullaby, the children's yeah, statue. The, the lullaby was going to be such a horn feature. I mean, it's just like the whole thing is just like it's you and it's beautiful. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a story. I'll shorten it, but there's a story about that. Oh, you don't have to shorten it, man. This is we're free form here, yeah. baby. And I'm going gonna, gonna to go back to the beginning. Good. I think in some ways, it's it's really important. Yeah. I always tell people that uh, one of the most important things that they can do as a as a uh, young player, as a player who wants to make it, is is as simple as it sounds. You must be prepared, and everybody is going to get some kind of an opportunity at some point in time, and if you're prepared you will be able to grab the, the ring on that opportunity and it will, it will serve you in really good stead. So that starts out this story that I was in Miami and uh, got a call from a, uh, and the other, the other point is I want to make it right quick is you never know who's listening. Mm. You never know who's listening. It could be Truth, good, it could be bad. And I have a bad story. But this was a good one. This was a good one. So I get a call from a guy who I'd never heard from before. Turns out he was like a, a, a second violin player, you know, one of those guys that died 20 years ago and nobody told him. And, uh, you know, so he called me and says, hey, man, I got, I got a concert for you. I didn't know mm -hmm. this guy. He says, um, I want you to pick three horns, and it's a four-horn section, and it's for a, a trumpet player called Chuck Mang, he mangled the name. And I said, well, I've never heard of him. And I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And well, you know, he's got a quartet and, and he writes music. The quartet plays a little bit and the orchestra plays a little bit. And you know, that's what it's about. So I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. So I went to the record store. You remember those? <laughs> I remember those. Yeah. And I looked for- R.I.P. Yeah, <laughs> I looked for, Specs music in mind. Anyway, I looked for Chuck Mangione's latest recording, and he had one that just came out. And I bought it and took it home and put it on my record player. Remember those? Yeah. Um, and um, and sure enough, one of the title tracks had a horn solo in it. wasn't long, wasn't big, but it was definitely featured the horn. So, of course, I, I took it off and learned it and, and blah, 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 as we went then to the first rehearsal um, of this concert. Of course, that's one of the first tunes we pulled and to, to rehearse. That's awesome. We get to the horn solo, and, of course, I knew it cold because I had worked, I had prepared. and I That's was so smart, man. And because uh, I sensed it being an opportunity for me that I really should take advantage of. Right. So we played it and I played it pretty well. And so Chuck didn't know who I was. So we got, went through it and as we were going by, he said, yeah, Horn. And so that was, that was his big compliment. Yeah, Horn. Um, so at the concert, you know, we played it. And uh, another moment to bring you down, I uh, played it pretty well. Uh, and uh, it was reviewed the next day in the paper. Uh, the reviewer, who I didn't know, said, uh, very nice uh, solo by an, the unidentified horn player. The unidentified <laughs> horn player. <laughs> Funny how I remember those moments, you know. Yeah, that was it. That was my big moment. In the so that was my first uh, introduction to Chuck or his introduction to me. It was such an important part that you you kind of glossed over because you you're that kind of a musician. You're such a great musician, and it's something that you would do. But it's so important for people who are listening to do, which is do a little bit of homework. And and for you, it was a lot harder to do homework than now. I think that album came out when I was born in '78. Oh uh, my! I, <laughs> sorry, man. I didn't mean to do that. But 
what I'm saying is you took the time to do the legwork, to go down to a place, research the guy who you were recording for, listen to the music, hear that there's a horn solo, learn the horn solo, sound great. I mean, this opened up a huge opportunity for you, huge doors for you, because you took some extra time to, to, to do something that not a lot of people, a lot of people might have just gone, okay, well, I'll just go to the session. So anyway, I just think that it's important for people who are listening to, and especially younger people, that you have to be thinking that way, the way that you were thinking. And it's easier to think that way now because now you could have just Googled him and, and found the recording on YouTube and just done it all in your chair for in about 20 minutes. And, and now people don't even want to do that. That's too hard, yeah. you know? And it's like people like you who have got a lot under their belt, you're the ones who put the extra time in, who put the extra effort in, and therefore you got to do the cool stuff afterwards because... Well, it opened doors. And the week after that concert, I mean, they, they left and went away and wherever they went after they left mine. If I had blown that solo, or if I wasn't ready to play it well, or if I hadn't done that work, and if I hadn't if I hadn't seen a possible opportunity and seized it and made sure I was prepared, it wouldn't have happened. But the next week I got a call. Hey man, Chuck wants you to want you to come to Rochester and play a concert with the orchestra. So I, I was thrilled. I'd never been asked to do anything like that in my life. So I went to Rochester and I met a lot of guys. A lot of people I never knew I wouldn't have known. And they wouldn't have known me. Um, right. And we played that concert. And it was all of, you know, Chuck's music at that point. Went home, really, really happy that uh, it had gone as well as it happened and really enjoyed it. Two weeks later, I get another call. Uh, Chuck is doing a movie. He'd really like for you to come out and play on it. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm there, man. Well, that's good when Chuck is doing a movie and he would really like you to come out and play across well, the country. I mean, you know, that, that says something about you. Here's the way I looked at it, man. He's doing these recordings in L.A. And he has a hundred of the greatest horn players in America right. at his disposal. And so he calls me. Now, that was wonderful. I, You know, it, it made my heart sing. But it also... I felt like, jeez, you know, I better go out there and do a good job. At that point in time, if it wasn't you, it probably would have been Vince DeRosa, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. 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 So I went out, and it was weird, man. It was a weird uh, recording because Chuck did, um, I don't know, 20-something hours of music for this film, and it wasn't like, write this cue for this scene Chuck just wrote stuff, lots of stuff, 20 hours, over 20 hours of stuff, you know. Wow, man. And so we went out, and um, uh, Brad Warner was there, and and a horn player Dickie Decker from, um, oh, God, I can't remember these guys anymore. Uh, so anyway, there were, there were four people, uh, four horn players. We played uh, a lot during the day, and it was really nothing of any significance. And then we broke for dinner, went to a restaurant, had dinner, and then Chuck sent us back to the, he had to go to the hotel to write some string parts for the next day's sessions. So he sent us back with Jeff Tysick to record the horn parts to Bella Villa. Now Bella Villa is uh, one of Chuck's probably most well-known other than uh, Feel So Good that he wrote for his mother. Uh, right. Was, name was Bella Villa. So in back of the studio, we recorded Bella Villa, and it was great. It was fabulous. You know, I, if, even if I do say so myself. So uh, Tysic called Chuck at the hotel, and he said, listen to this. And I yelled at Chuck, man, we don't need any effing trumpets on this thing. Just leave it like the horns. Just leave <laughs> yeah, it. man. We don't but, need no stinking trumpets. That's right, you know. So anyway, he said, to, he took Tysic back on the phone. He says, hey, get the lullaby, man, and have feel to the lullaby. So 
Jeff broke out the lead sheet to the lullaby and we went in the studio, just me. And uh, we recorded it. And the story of the ending is, is this. Um, just as we finish, it's three times through, you know, it just goes on forever. Well, and I was going to say, I mean, you're telling the story of the ending, but I mean, the, the piece itself is beautiful. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole thing is just beautiful horn and it showcases your tone. It showcases the, the beauty of your playing. Well, thanks, and then you man. get to the end. That's yeah. right. So there's basically five chords at the end, uh, string chords held, you know. And about the, and we got there, and I'm looking at the I'm looking at the page, and there's nothing there. Now about this time, Chuck comes in, and he comes in and he sits down. And he says, "You know, man, I don't care what you do. You know, um, he says I kind of you know played the chords and stuff and played around with it. But I don't really care what you do." So that gave me a lot of help. Some guy that you know just sitting there wondering what the heck he's going to do. So we did it. And first chord, ba ba bee bee dee bee. Second chord, ba 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 bee bee ba dee bee. Ba da ba 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 da ba. Now the fourth chord, I was going to play C, E flat, G, ba ba ba. I'm singing the wrong notes, I know. Ba 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 dee ba. And then I clammed the first note. So instead of playing a C, I <laughs> I hit a B flat, and I clammed right into the C, and I went ahead and I thought, oh man, you know, it was going. <laughs> this is my first mistake, you know, wild. So, you know, we're gonna have to go back and do that whole thing over again. And so okay, they let the tape run, and we got to the last measure, and and I played what you hear on the recording. I didn't intend to. It just <laughs> kind of, you know, I was kind of screwing around, frankly. I wish all my non-intentional things were, were there. <laughs> well, <laughs> I just was messing around because I knew I was going to have to go back and fix that mistake. And I've had guys say, well, that was a flute. You know, the, the, I know it was a flute. I guarantee it was a flute, you know. <laughs> I, I used to have the scar to, to prove it, but um, so I sat there when it was over and I, I was waiting for them to, to, you know, to come in and say, all right, let's go back and fix that mistake. And I didn't move. And so Patrick came into the, the, the studio and said, aren't you going to come in and listen to that? And I said, aren't we going to fix that mistake? He said, what mistake? So I went <laughs> in and that, that wrong note sounded like I intended to play it. Oh, that's amazing, man. And if you listen to that, next time you listen to that, you'll hear ba da ba ba ba. But to me, it was ba. But that's not the way it came out. So that's that, insane. And you know what's crazy is that if that were written out, and you had and you had messed that, you it would have freaked you out because oh, you absolutely. cracked the note and stuff. But instead, it becomes this iconic, like horn. So I mean, it's. Is it crazy how, I mean, the, just the difference? I'm sure people will, will disagree with this, but I had never heard anybody do that. I had never done it, you know? So the fact that it went on, on, on the record. And this is uh, a guy who's sold millions and millions and millions of records. I mean, it's one thing to record for, you know, Naxos or Deutsche Grammophon or whatever, and it's like, and the, your classical listeners listen to it. And it's another thing when it's mainstream pop music at the time, highest of the high, and you've got a French horn player who's got a whole track to, you know, realize that this is something that was improvised and that yeah. was just like offhand. I mean, that's, it's, it's awesome. You know, it, as I already said, it changed my life and it truly did, you know, cause I, you know, I was still living in Miami and, you know, still playing in the orchestra, teaching it to school. And um, all of a sudden, things changed. You know, it was basically one note that did it, you know, even though it was kind of an accident. That's yeah. incredible, man. <laughs> but, so after... But, and I'll take it. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
here's another funny thing. It was years before I told Chuck what happened. Oh, really? No, I didn't tell him that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you meant to do that. I mean, come on. But, but he told he tells the story. Though. He tells it accurately. So it's pretty really? cool. Yeah, yeah. I've had oh, people my gosh. say that they've seen him in, in sessions where, you know, he, he, he talks to people and they ask him the question about it. And he always tells them the truth, you know, and laughs about it. So it was kind of, it was a great moment. Yeah. But it did. It changed my life. And it, and it uh, you know, I, I can only wish that everyone has that some kind of an opportunity with the horn in their hand that gives them some kind of change of the way they feel about their playing, the way they feel about their life with the horn in their hand. I mean, you know, the other side of that coin was, when they called me and told me they were going to take the Sanchez music on the road that summer. And uh, the whole second half of the concert was going to be from the movie. You know, I thought, oh, that's great. And then I thought, holy mackerel, I'm going to have to play that damn thing every night. <laughs> was that on it? Did you have to play that every night? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness, man! Well, you're the kind of horn player who had who had that those chops, I man. I didn't play the app every night. I'll tell you that. But did you fancy yourself uh, a high horn player? I mean, um, somewhat, somewhat, yeah. But I don't think I'd ever played a, a, a an, an F above high C uh, ever. I don't think. Mm. Uh, not you know, not other than just you know being a smart aleck. Um, right. Uh, but, you know, and I don't know if other people were doing that same kind of thing or not. After you played with him, who did you well, play with? I was in New York at that point, you know, or right. I, New York shortly after that. And what it led to was, I, I mentioned Jeff Tyzik, who mm. had, was writing music, music of his own. He was a trumpet player and was writing uh uh, complete albums of music that he he wrote performed on some but you know they were his music and so he called me at one point and uh, asked me to come to New York to uh, to play on his record which I did and when it went in the studio and there was a there was a brass date going on in the studio that he was doing and um, you know a lot of some of the guys that I knew from Chuck's band was there and uh, Alan Rubin, I don't know if you know, a lot of people who are listening would know who Alan Rubin is. Okay. Or died a few years ago. He's a trumpet player. And one of the, uh, one of the busiest trumpet players in New York uh, for, for jingles and, and recordings. And he was on that date. And so when they finished, I went in and sat down to do what Jeff uh, wanted me to do. And Jeff knew my playing very well, so he wrote some real scream and stuff. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but those brass guys stayed and listened. And when I finished, uh, I went in the studio and I was talking to Alan. Um, and I told him that I was kind of thinking about moving to New York. And he says, let me tell you mm -hmm. something. This when you move here, make me the first phone call you make. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I will. So we moved to New York. I called Alan first. And at that time, the booking agency in New York was called Radio Registry. And uh -huh. Alan said, have you, uh, have you uh, registered with Radio Registry yet? And I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, try to give him a call. So I hung up with Alan and my phone rang five minutes later. And it was a jingle date for the next morning from Radio Registry, who I was not even a part of. And so my second day in New York, I got my first jingle. <laughs> That's awesome. Man. It was because of Alan, right. which was because of that recording session with Tysic, which was because of the children of Sanchez, which was because of the concert in Rochester, which was because of the concert in Miami. Wow, man. I mean, this is something that a lot of people don't think about is that that whole domino effect, the yep. chain reaction of where can your career go because of one thing. That's right. You know? I mean, when you really think about it, 
<laughs> that's that's pretty crazy. It really is, yeah. and it was all it was all due to one little solo. <laughs> well, little little solo. Well, yeah. I mean, it was in Miami when I played that solo. That that's yeah. where that's where it stemmed from, right there. Right. If I'd that up, if I'd screwed that up, and uh, and nobody wanted to listen to me anymore, that would have been the end of it. It's a lot of people attribute things to people getting lucky breaks, and I hear that term "lucky break" a lot. And some people are luckier than others, but I, I really like that quote that, uh, what is it, like, uh, luck is when uh, preparation meets opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And you have to always be prepared, like you yep. said. I mean, this is this is really cool, just hearing your stories. So um, you, have, you have kids, and both of your kids, they're both very successful musicians. Yeah. And uh, so they, they take after dad. I know that your daughter is a very, very good flute player. Yeah, in Philadelphia, yes, with Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. a, an outstanding artist. I mean, mm -hmm. my son's a horn player and, right? and fine, fine player, a much better player than than I ever was. Um, mm. And she's a, you know, they're they're artists. You know, I was a I was a journeyman horn player. You know. <laughs> but both of these guys are real artists, you know, and, and so I couldn't be more proud of them, obviously. But Well, your son's playing on Broadway, right? Yeah, well, not at the present. But, well, uh, I know that, yeah, yeah this, all this craziness going on. But. Uh, yeah, he's doing, um, he's doing Aladdin, mm -hmm. uh, and, but he's doing a, a passel of other stuff. He's doing a lot of work with the Philharmonic. He was scheduled to go on tour with them again. He's already gone to tour with him twice and, um, and does, does a lot of recordings. So he's very successful and, and mm. doing very well. But just yeah. like you said, I mean, here he is. He has no jobs. Right. You know, the prospect for work, freelance work in New York, is like zilch at this point. But it's he's zilch everywhere, man. It's really down sad. Down. You know. Butt off every day, you know? So it's this, it's just as you said, and he knows that if he doesn't do that, that not only is he going to lose his edge, but he's not going to be as good a player as he should be when, when the bell rings and the red light goes on, you know? Right. So when they were, when they were young, did you foster that, that musicality in them or were they just naturally curious? I'm just um, curious because I've got a six year old son and, I have a 14 year old daughter and it's just, did they actively ask you about stuff or did you kind of like influence them or what? Um, I, first of all, I told my daughter not to play the flute. <laughs> really? How'd oh, that work out for you? <laughs> well, it's obvious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, you know, don't play the flute. I mean, there, there's a million of great flutists out there. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere and there's good ones. And in order to be a great flute player, you got to have such a fire in your belly that right. you just have to know that you got to be better than everybody else. And for you to do that, it's going to take an incredible amount of dedication and discipline. Blah 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 blah. You know, and it's interesting with my son David because uh, he has a has a has two daughters. One is very young, a year older, and and but the other one is is starting to play piano a little bit and and do homework that now that the parents are having to help them with and, and right. he's so frustrated you know because she doesn't she doesn't do what he wants her to do she doesn't listen all the time it's like she has he has to tell her 12 times to do something you know and he says to my wife the other day he says you remember how dad was with me I feel like that's what I'm becoming with my daughter. So <laughs> full yeah. circle, man. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was tough on him to be my to be my son, and I actually ended up teaching him at the University of Miami. Oh, really? So, well, you taught a bunch of my colleagues, man. I mean, uh, Jose Cibaja oh, talks yeah. about you all the time. Domingo Pagliuca talks Those about guys. you. I mean. Yeah, so, you know, and I know my son told somebody, gee, you know, it's, it's interesting that I'm able to finally realize my father might have known what he was talking about. So, <laughs> you know, 
but he has become a, a, a first first class horn player, man. That's he awesome. Gets all over the horn and plays in tune, doesn't miss a whole lot. Misses less than I did. did. So <laughs> proud of them both. But I, well, you, you got to tell him to miss a couple of notes every once in a while because that uh, that miss like, note for you in, in that little cadenza <laughs> ended up being something good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm really proud of them, and, and I, their mother had a lot to do with it too. You know, she's not a she's not a music, she doesn't play an instrument, but she's very musical, and she was like uh, hell on wheels with them as uh, as piano students early on. I mean, she would sit next to them on the piano bench and beat the hell out of them until they, you know, they did what they were supposed to do. So, you know, <laughs> I credit her with a lot of the early early things that the kids were, were able to do, so. Yeah, uh, that's really cool. I, I mean, it's so much fun. I mean, seeing kids relate to music when they're younger, you know. I mean, my son walks around and and he sings whatever warm up that I'm doing. He ends up yeah. singing it, yeah. and then whatever movie that we're watching, he ends up singing. You know, today he was just singing Jurassic Park while he was doing some homework. <laughs> you know, great. And, that is you know, so great. That's special yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, totally special stuff, man. Well, I got to tell you, this has been so much fun for me, Jerry. Just talking like to you, getting to pick your brain. Uh, just a such a special horn player like you and and once again I gotta say the people who have been in the commercial side in the recording side movies recordings uh, albums all that kind of stuff and and you in particular play a big part in my uh, upbringing as a young horn player and uh, and even now and and I think that Anybody who's listening right now, which are mostly horn players, I'm assuming, you guys should go out and get these these albums and listen to what's out there and really hone in on people that you might not might not be the household name that like a a horn soloist like a Barry Tuckwell or a, you know Dennis Brain were, but these are important people to be listening to. I mean, the the stuff that they recorded, they prepared months and months and years for to record. And then the stuff that guys like like you, Jerry, recorded were just on the fly. <laughs> and it's yeah. just it, it's it's a different animal, but it's the same instrument. And it's something that we really need to be thinking about as musicians. So thank you so much, man. Well, it, it was a pleasure to spend some time with you, man. And, and I've told you before several times how impressed I am with what you're doing with the horn and, and how you're presenting it almost every day to the world. And, and you're, you know, you're doing so much great work that, um, that really puts the, not only your musicianship, but puts the instrument out there. And uh, it really, I, I appreciate everything you do you're doing and it's great for the horn community it's great for everyone man thank you for doing all that stuff i'm so impressed well, thank you man no thank you this has been a true pleasure cheers to you here's to health and happiness and mus musicality thank man the same to you and yours have a great one man be careful all right thank you so much all right. jerry all right bye-bye catch you later bye